Amen, amen. Good morning, First Baptist Church. It is great to be here at church with you guys this morning. Uh, if you would, would you stand uh, in honor of God's Word as we read from the book of First John, starting in chapter 5. We'll read First John chapter 5, starting in verse 10. God's Word says this. It says, Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have towards him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Let's pray together in light of that promise. Father, uh, we know you hear us. Uh, God, we know, um, God, that you want us to pray and God, that you answer our prayers. And we thank you for that. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would lend your ear to First Baptist this morning. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would fill our hearts, uh, God, with your love and your spirit. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would guide us in worship, and uh, Lord, that we come together in unity, uh, God, in glory of your name. Lord, I pray that uh, during this service as a family, uh, Lord, we would hear from you. Uh, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be receptive to uh, your commands, God, and your guidance through your word this morning. Uh, Lord, and I pray that uh, if there is anyone here at First Baptist that has not put their trust in you, God, does, that does not have that life that uh, we mentioned uh, and that we read from in 1 John. Uh, Lord, I pray that if there's someone here that does not have that promise of eternal life, that today would be the day uh, that they are saved. And God, we trust that you can do that. Uh, and so, Lord, we just ask that in humbleness uh, and for your glory. In Jesus' awesome name. And all God's people said, Good Amen. Good morning, church. Y'all can remain standing as we worship the Lord together. Good morning, church. It is good to see everyone this morning. If you are a visitor with us this morning, thank you for being here uh, and choosing to worship with us today. I have just a couple announcements for us. First, uh, next Sunday, immediately following service, there will be a Sunday school teacher luncheon. 
Uh, and so we're getting ready to start our fall semester in Sunday school classes. Uh, we just want to catch up with our Sunday school teachers. And so Sunday school teachers, if you can't attend, because we're ordering food, want to make sure that we have food for everyone for that luncheon. But if you can't make it, make sure that you contact the church office or talk to uh, Christian or myself. And then also we have uh, a baby shower coming. And so uh, on September the 8th from 2 to 4 p.m. in the Go Center, uh, there will be a baby shower for uh, Tiffany and Kendall Catron. Uh, they got another baby on the way. Uh, another little baby girl. I know what it's like having three girls, and, and uh, just pray for them uh, is what I would suggest. Uh, but also um, be there for that, and they're registered at Walmart, uh, and, and we'll have a good time celebrating the coming of their another, their another baby girl into their life. All right, I'm going to pray, and as I pray, if we would have the ushers come forward uh, to take up our offering this morning, if you would bow with me. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and Father, we give you thanks. Father, you're a God that, that does hear our prayers. You're a God that listens to our needs. You're, you're, you're a God that, that knows what we need even, even more than we know ourselves. And so, Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for being just an amazing God that loved us so much that you sent your son, Jesus, into this world, to this sinful world, to, to live a perfect life that we couldn't live, to die on a cross, to pay a debt that we couldn't pay. Father, I pray that if there's someone here this morning that doesn't know your son Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, Father, I pray that today that they would come to know him, that they would be changed into a new creation in you, that they would follow you, that they would know in their heart that they have been forgiven and that they have an eternity awaiting for them in heaven. And Father, as we take up our offering this morning, Father, I pray that we would do our very best to use Every, every dime that is given to this church to reach more and more people with the gospel. Father, that's why we exist, to give you glory and spread your word. And Father, I pray that we would be a lighthouse into this community, shining your light everywhere we go. And Father, we thank you for this service, this opportunity to come into your house to worship you. Father, let us be focused on the word that is shared. And I pray for Brother Christian this morning as he shares that word. And it's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. All right. Yes, thank you, Angela. 
y'all want to stand with us, we, we will continue singing and worshiping. Satisfied. 
so much and God we are so grateful to be in your presence today God to be able to worship you with our brothers and sisters God is such a blessing and Lord we just praise you right now for this opportunity to be together as the body and God right now we just pray that you would receive all the glory all the honor from us and I pray that during this time God as we dive into your word together Lord that you would open our hearts God that we would be ready to just receive whatever you have for us today God and I pray that as Christian preaches, Lord, that our hearts would be open. God, I pray that we would leave change today, God, that whatever you have for us, God, that we would just um, just open our hearts and our minds, God, and that you would guide us as we leave here today after the sermon, God, that we would just be ready to go and show your love. God, because that's what you've called us to do, to be your hands and your feet and your love to this world, God. Help us to just show love to every single person that you put in our, in our path this week, God, and we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Raise your hand if you have ever had an answered prayer any time in your life. All right, hands down. Raise your hand if you have ever, uh, let's just say not ever, let's say in the past month. Have you seen God answer a specific prayer in the past month? A show of hands. All right, hands down. Raise your hand if you've seen God answer a prayer. Don't just raise your hand to spiritual, just raise it if it's really happened. Uh, raise your hand if you've seen God answer a prayer this week that you have prayed. Show of hands. We need to do a little more praying this week. All right. We, we have seen God congregationally answer prayers, uh, and you have seen it in your lives. Uh, you've seen it in the lives of others uh, this morning. The past two weeks, we've been on a series in prayer. We've been going through the Sermon uh, on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. And seeing what God says about prayer. Uh, in Matthew chapter 6, we have seen how not to pray. We have seen how to pray. After Matthew chapter 6, Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, spends time on a few different topics. But then in Matthew chapter 7, he comes back to the idea of prayer. And so he shows us how to pray. He preaches a little longer. And, and then he comes back to this idea of prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. And that's what we're going to do is we're going to finish this series on prayer through the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 7. Here's the main idea of our entire message, uh, and really one of the main ideas I see in Scripture concerning prayer, and it's this. It's that God loves to answer prayer. And what happens in Matthew chapter 7 is that God shows us how much He loves to answer prayer. Let me show you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Here's what Jesus says. He says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and to the one who, find, or one who seeks, finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Jesus asked in verse 9, or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? 
If then you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask Him? God loves to answer prayers. How much? Well, Matthew chapter 7 shows us how much. What happens in verse 7 is that three different ways Jesus is saying, pray, ask, seek, knock. And then if it wasn't enough to say three different ways, hey, I want you to pray in verse 7, he comes back in verse 8 and says the same exact thing he said in verse 7. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. And so here's what we see in verse 7 and verse 8. Jesus is basically saying this. He's saying, ask him, ask him, ask him. Ask him, ask him, ask him. Or, or you could say it this way. In verse 7 and verse 8, he's saying, pray, 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 pray. And if, if that's not enough, he, he goes off and, and talks a little bit about the good father giving good gifts. But then he comes back to this same idea in verse 11 at the very end of this teaching on prayer. Look what he says. Father who is in heaven, he will give good things to those who ask him. And so Matthew chapter 7 has seven different ways in which Jesus tells us to pray. Basically, here's it, here it is. Ask, 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 ask. Pray, 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 pray. pray. Pray, like, like Jesus is telling us, God wants to answer your prayers. And let me tell you seven different times that he wants to. He wants to hear from you. He, he, wants, to, he wants you to send your cries to him. And then he wants to take those cries to him. And he wants to answer them according to his will. This is what God wants to do. So does God love to answer prayers? The Bible says astoundingly, yes. He loves it. He commands us to do it. Jesus tells us that God loves to answer prayers and he loves to make it known. Now, we know that that's our main point. We'll come back to that at the end. God loves to answer prayers. But if your brain has already went to this, or, or maybe you have asked this question before in your life, all right, Christian, I understand Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through 11. God wants us to ask and he wants us to pray. But what about when my prayers don't get answered? What about the things I'm praying for that, that haven't been answered? Like, like Christian, I, I, I raised my hand. Yes, God has answered my prayer before. In fact, I even raised my hand that he answered a prayer I prayed this week. But you know what, Christian? There are still some things that I've prayed for that he hasn't answered. What do we do with those? I, I have a list of things I, I pray for that me personally, I have not seen the answer to. What, what do I do with those as pastor? God, I've been praying for these. Some have been a few weeks. Some I've been praying for years, and I haven't got the answer to yet. What do I do with those? Well, we're going to look at a few different reasons on maybe why it seems or why our prayers are not answered. But, but let me start with this. When it comes to the idea of our prayers not being answered, I, I think the first thing and the first way to answer it, uh, and maybe the easiest way to initially get into this conversation, is to simply say, well, you know what? A lot of our prayers... They just haven't been answered yet. Like, yes, you're praying, but the reason they haven't been answered is because God is, is waiting for the right time to answer that prayer. Now, that's an easy answer, and it doesn't answer all our questions on this topic. But initially, we can come to this problem with the idea that God hasn't answered our problems yet. And, and you know what? Scripture actually references this idea. And, and Scripture it gives us an awareness that, hey, you know what? Sometimes we need to be patient and be persistent in prayer. For example, Luke chapter 18. In Luke chapter 18, verse 1, and this is not the only uh, area where this idea is covered, but in Luke chapter 18, verse 1, uh, Jesus, he's getting ready to tell a parable. And as he tells this parable, this story, to illustrate this heavenly point, he, the, the writer Luke, in chapter 18, verse 1, look what he says. As he goes to tell this parable, he says, and Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. And so Luke, we don't always get this with parables. Luke chapter 18 just happens to be one of those where we get the reason uh, and what this parable is about. Luke says this parable, the purpose of it is to teach us that we always ought to pray and that we don't need to lose heart in prayer. And then Luke goes on telling the story that Jesus told. Here's the story. There was a certain city where there was a judge, and this judge, he, he didn't fear God, and he really didn't respect mankind either. He, he didn't care about God. He really didn't care about man. He wasn't a very merciful judge. And what happens is this widow comes to this judge. In Luke, and in Luke chapter 18, he tells this story that this widow comes, and she's seeking justice from an adversary. 
And she comes to this judge, and because he doesn't really care about her situation, he's not a compassionate judge, he's really what the Bible describes as an evil man, because he doesn't care about this individual widow, he doesn't give her justice. He doesn't listen to really her plea for justice from this adversary. Well, as Jesus goes on to tell this story, what he tells is that this widow keeps coming to this judge. And look what the Gospel of Luke says in chapter 18, verse 4. It says, For while he refused, afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down with her continual coming. And then he goes on to say this, And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? The point is not to relate God to this evil judge. It's to say, hey, if the evil judge will eventually give in, how much more so will a God who is not evil, who wants to hear our prayers and who wants to answer them, how much more will he answer our prayers when we pray consistently, when we pray with persistence that, God, I'm coming to you again and again, day and night. I trust and I have faith that you'll answer this prayer. And so Luke chapter 18, it's to teach us the idea that we always ought to pray and we, we, we don't need to lose heart, even those times when it seems like our prayers are not being answered. We need to keep praying. We need to, as Paul says, pray without ceasing, pray continually. And scripture teaches this idea. And so sometimes when it comes to, hey, Christian, my prayers are not being answered, well, one of the first things we have to ask is, well, maybe the timing's not right. Pray persistently. But this doesn't answer all the questions as regard to why our prayers aren't answered. In fact, remember, when we look at Matthew chapter 7, we understand that God does answer prayer and he wants to answer prayers. Um, But but church, we'll preach this till we're blue in the face until Jesus comes home. We don't just take one specific passage and and learn everything about the Bible from one specific, specific passage and everything God has for us. We have to look at the Bible in its entirety. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation is one story, and we have to see all of what Scripture says about a particular topic to understand it. And so Matthew chapter 7, yes, God wants us to ask, and He will answer our prayers. We also see other places in Scripture where there are hindrance to prayer life, and there are times where God doesn't answer for specific reasons. Now, why is that? Well, I'll give you a few reasons, but there's really one encompassing reason, and you probably already guessed it, and that is sin. The psalmist in Psalms chapter 66, he says this. The psalmist in chapter 66, verse 18, he says, If I had cherished iniquity in my heart. In other words, he says, if I had cherished sin, if I had held closely to sin in in my life, or if I had walked in sin, listen to what the psalmist says. If I had done so, the Lord would not have listened. He, He says, if I would have continued in sin, then I know If I would have happened to do this, that God wouldn't have answered my prayers. Because here's what we know according to Scripture. Isaiah chapter 59, our sin has made a separation between us and God. Sin, it makes a gap between us and God. It separates us from Him. Every time we sin, we reject God. We're In essence, we're turning our back on Him and walking in a completely opposite direction in the will that He has for us. Sin, it creates a separation. Now, we know the good news. We know the story that Jesus Christ came to this world. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for our sins, and he rose again from the grave, giving us the chance for that gap that sin created that gives us a chance to put our trust in Jesus and that gap being brought together in reconciliation because of the work of Christ. We know that, but we understand that sin, it constantly causes this gap, this separation between us and God. Now, now here's what we also see, and this is for believers. Yes, Jesus has saved us, but we know if we cherish iniquity in our hearts, If we continue to walk in sin, the Lord will not listen as the psalmist says. And this is a common thing we see throughout Scripture. For example, John chapter 9, verse 31, uh, it says this. It says, we know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God does listen to him. And so there's instances where God listens, and there's instances where God does not listen to certain prayers. Peter gives us a specific example, uh, and I really like Peter. Um, really specifying a, a particular moment when someone doesn't walk in the will of God and their prayers being hindered. Here's what Peter says. Chapter 3, verse 7. He says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. And so, men, he's talking to us specifically. I believe this verse can relate to women as well, but the specific context is to men. And here's what Peter says. Walk and live 
with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. And then listen to what Peter says. Do this so that your prayers may not be hindered. In other words, if a man does not walk in an understanding way of his wife, if he does not walk in a way that is honoring his, his wife, if he doesn't walk in a way where, where he is not living according to Scripture the way God has called him to be a, a husband, Peter says that directly, that, that gap in that relationship, that, that not walking in the will of God, that can have an effect and hinder his prayer life. And so we understand that sin, all throughout Scripture, it shows us the separation that it causes, but it also shows us that sin definitely has a hindrance on our prayer life. Now, now let's break this down even further. Scripture shows this, and we've, we looked at a few of these very quickly last week, and we're going to emphasize them again. Uh, one way where our prayers are hindered is we know in the area, if we struggle with prideful desires and we pray pridefully, we know that our prayers will definitely be hindered. We looked last week at James chapter 4, verse 3. It says, you ask and you do not receive. Well, why don't, why, why sometimes, Matthew says, you ask and you will receive, ask and it will be given. Why does James say that sometimes you ask and you do not receive? Is he refuting his own brother Christ? Well, no. James says this. He says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly and you do so to spend it on your own passions. And so what James is getting to is that sometimes we don't receive things in prayer because we are selfishly asking for our uh, own selves to be glorified rather than God himself to be glorified. In other words, James didn't know what a gumball machine was, but I think what he's pointing to is that sometimes we treat God like that cosmic, divine gumball machine. I remember growing up, there's a Mexican restaurant right by my house, Sol Azteca. We went there just about every Sunday, and, and there was this gumball machine. I never uh, got bubble gum except if it was from that machine. And what happens? You put the quarter in, you turn it, and then what happens? A every single kid, they go to this gumball machine. They put their quarter in, they turn it. They put their hands at the bottom of the gumball machine expecting exactly what they desired. I want a gumball. That's exactly what I want, and I want it now. And sometimes I, I think we, if we're not careful, we won't adhere to the words of James through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And what happens is we treat God like, God, I want this and I want it. I want it now. Like, God, I, I, I want this and I want it now. And, and we don't do it for his reasons or for his glory or for his purposes. We do it strictly because that's our desire. And here's what James says. He says, don't treat God like a cosmic divine gumball machine. Don't do that because if you do so, you're asking God wrongly and you just want prayer to fulfill your own passions and desires. And so we understand prideful desires do, biblically, um, they hinder our, our prayer life. Also, we see this, and we looked at this very quickly last week. We know that if we don't pray in faith, that our prayers will not be answered. James chapter 1, verse 6 through 8, jot this down if you're taking notes. It says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person that prays, doubting, the person that prays not in faith that God can answer and do a mighty work through that prayer, James says this, that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's double-minded man. He is unstable in his ways. James says, look, if you ask, in, and I know it's hard sometimes. Look, I, I know this. I get so many prayer requests every week, and then sometimes those prayer requests you get, you're really wondering, God, do you, are you going to answer this? You get prayer requests of a terrible diagnosis, and you're really thinking, God, do you really want to heal this person? Are, are you going to? Th those doubts easily can creep in. God, I, I'm praying and praying, but sometimes we think when we look at us and who we are and our smallness and we think of the vastness of God and we say, God, do you really want to answer me? I just don't know if you want to come through on this. And the Bible says that's not the type of prayer we're to pray. Yes, we pray humbly and according to the will of God and not selfishly, but every time we come to the throne of God, every time we come to the feet of Jesus, we come expectantly. We come in faith. God, I believe and I trust in your power and in your greatness and out of, here's what Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 says, my God will supply every need of yours according to the riches of his glory. The riches of God's glory are eternal. His riches are forever. And so, of course, God, out of the riches of his glory, can answer our prayers no matter how big they might be, which is why James says we must ask in faith. 
and not doubting because the one who doubts should not even suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. And so there's prideful desires. There's doubt that hinders our prayer. But, but also, um, and in the Lord's Prayer, we were taught to pray, thy kingdom come. God, we want your rule and your reign in our life. We were also taught that, God, we want your will to, to be um, our will. God, God, we want your will to be done in every circumstance and every situation. Well, along those lines, here's what we know, is sometimes our prayers are hindered when we don't pray according to the will of God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 through 15, I read earlier. So let me restate what that says. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 through 15. John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Who is the Son of God? Jesus. All right, that was your chance to give your Sunday school answer. I was giving you a chance. You missed it. That was hard. You got it. <laughs> that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have towards him. That if we ask anything according to Jesus' will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. And so here's what First John says. Matthew chapter 7 says, ask and you will receive. That's 100% true. John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he goes on to say, when you ask, you ask according to his will. It's the same thing Jesus told us to pray in Matthew chapter 6. It's not that he's coming to Matthew chapter 7 just out of the blue saying, hey, ask whatever you want and it'll be given no matter what it is. He's already told us in Matthew chapter 6 how to pray. And so when we come to Matthew chapter 7, we understand we already know how to pray in Matthew chapter 6. As we read through this prayer, we know to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And so, of course, when we pray God's will be done and his kingdom come, our prayers will be answered on that account. First John is just echoing and putting all that into one verse. He says, when we ask according to his will, then he hears us. In the Gospel of John, John chapter 14, verse 13, he says, whatever you ask in my name... Jesus says, these are the words of Jesus directly, he says, this I will do, and I do it so that the Father will be glorified in the Son. And then he says in verse 14, if you ask me anything in my name, Jesus says, if you ask in my name, I will do it. Now, here's where we have to understand what does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? What does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? Here's what it doesn't mean. Uh, and I know you have seen this before, maybe in uh, emphasized in a church you went to, or maybe you have seen it online. Uh, and so I'm not trying to, to, to step on any toes, but I'm just trying to tell you what it's not. And we know this according to Scripture. To pray in Jesus' name is not to get up there and, and, and scream whatever prayer you want and put the tagline in Jesus' name at the end, and that magical tagline is going to make everything come, tr come true. I, I literally watched a video this morning where uh, a speaker did that exact thing. They were praying, and they just kept repeating, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Y'all have heard that before. In Jesus' name, we, we believe. We be they were saying in Jesus' name, but just because you add in Jesus' name on the end of a prayer doesn't mean you're praying in Jesus' name. L let me try to explain this. Just adding a tagline I'm not, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to say there's not power in the name of Jesus. We understand there's power in the name of Jesus. But here's the problem if we just think praying in Jesus' name is adding in Jesus' name at the end of a prayer. Here's what it becomes. It basically becomes an incantation where we're, just, we're, we're putting up a spell to God, and if we just say it the right way, then he'll answer it. Do you see that? Adding in Jesus' name at the end of the prayer is not praying in Jesus' name and according to his will, which praying in Jesus' name is. Just saying in Jesus' name, yes, I'm not saying you don't. I just prayed that a few minutes ago. I'm going to continue to add that at the end of my, my prayers. But I know that just saying in Jesus' name is not praying exactly in his name and according to his will. Because if that was the case, then that would just be like me casting a spell and Christianity is not witchcraft. So, so, so it's different. What, what do I mean? Well, let, let's go a little further. To pray in Jesus' name is this. It is to pray in line with who he is and according to his will. Especially in Scripture, and I believe today, but more so in Scripture, a name means something and a name represents someone. And so when we pray in Jesus' name, what we're truly doing is we're praying on behalf of the character of Christ and we're praying on behalf of who he is. So when I pray in Jesus' name, I'm praying knowing that he is God and I'm praying on behalf of his will and his character. 
To pray in Jesus' name is, in essence, what John said. It is to pray according to his will. When we pray truly in Jesus' name, we're not just saying in Jesus' name at the end of the prayer. Yes, you can say that. I told you. I just said that. But to truly pray in Jesus' name is to pray on his behalf, according to his character, and according to his will. John MacArthur, he gives three ways on what it means to pray in Jesus' name. Uh, And I think he does a very good job defining this. Number one, he says the believers who pray in Jesus' name, this should be for his purpose and his kingdom and not selfish reasons, which we've looked at. Number two, the believer's prayer should be on the basis of, hear this, on Jesus' merits and not on any personal merit or worthiness. Um, R.A. Torrey, he was an evangelist several years ago, uh, an author as well. Listen to what he says on this topic of praying to God and, and praying to Jesus on his merit. Here's what Tori says. He says, when I go to God in prayer, it is like going to the bank of heaven. I have nothing deposited there. I have absolutely no credit there. If I go in my own name, I will get absolutely nothing. But Jesus Christ has unlimited credit in heaven, right? Philippians 4.19. And he has granted me the privilege of going to the bank with his name on my checks. When I thus go, my prayers will be honored to any extent. To pray in the name of Christ is to pray on the ground of his credit, not mine. It is to renounce the thought that I have any claims on God whatsoever and approach him on the ground of Christ's claims. When I pray in Jesus' name, I'm praying according to his will, and I'm praying on according to the credit that he has in heaven, which is infinite and unlimited. That's what it looks like to pray in Jesus' name. Then number three, MacArthur says this. He says the believer's prayer should be in a pursuit of his glory alone. This is why Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified. The two go hand in hand. Praying in Jesus' name is a prayer that the Father would be glorified. And so we're to pray in Jesus' name. What does that look like? In essence, it's praying according to his will based upon who he is. Now, I know it's hard to understand the will of God. Here's the good news. The good news is, as believers who have been saved by the grace of God, who have put their trust in Jesus Christ, I I like to hammer this into our heads, that we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do not forget the gift of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, that we should be praying at all times in the Spirit. What does it look like to pray in the Spirit? Well, Paul gives us a good idea in Romans chapter 8. He says this. He says, Romans chapter 8, verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Thank God for the Holy Spirit, who when we don't know what to pray, Paul says this, when we don't know what we ought to pray, the Spirit himself intercedes for us. And as the Holy Spirit who's inside of us, who is a gift from God at the moment of our salvation, when he continues to help us as we are filled with the Spirit, as we pray, we trust that the Spirit's going to help us to pray, which is why Paul says this in verse 27. And he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, Because the Spirit intercedes for the Christians according to, hear this, the will of God. When we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit is the helper who helps us know how to pray the will of God. In other words, the Holy Spirit helps us to pray in Jesus' name according to his will. And we thank God for that. And so all throughout Scripture, there's occasions when maybe our prayers aren't being answered And what I encourage us and what I try to do for for myself is always check, is there an area of sin in my life that could be hindering certain prayers? I believe God wants to do incredible things, church. I I truly believe that. And sometimes he's just waiting for us to to be repentant and then to be confessional and, and understand that when we walk in sin, that might cause a gap or a hindrance in our prayers. He wants to answer our prayers, but we must walk in the will of Christ And pray in his name, in the spirit, to see those prayers answered. And so sometimes our sin, it causes a hindrance. Now, this is not the only answer to why our prayers are not being answered. Why is that? Well, sometimes when our prayers seem like they're not being answered, here's what I found in my life. The reality is those prayers have been answered, but the answer is no. Sometimes there's been prayers in my life where, God, you're not answering them. And then I look back and I say, oh, actually, that prayer and the answer to that prayer, it it, it was no. Zion, he's at that stage now. There's three things he really likes. 
outlets, a stove at 375 degrees, and dog food. Loves them. Now, we have to guard him from the outlets. We've put new outlets in every wall in the house, so we have those safety ones, so we're pretty good there. He's got a little freedom in that one. The stove, we have to guard him because he's just wanting to jump right in, not recognizing what 375 degrees is. Uh, we have to guard him in that. And then the dog food, well, I know it's the lesser of all evils, but we don't let him have the dog. We try to put the dog bowl up. Here's, here's the idea. Zion, in his curiosity, he wants those things, but our answer is always going to be no, because he just doesn't have the knowledge to know the harmful effects of those very desires that he wants. He doesn't know that. Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. When we read this morning, yes, ask and you will receive, Jesus goes on and he, goes, he gives an example of an earthly father. An earthly father who is marred by sin. And here's what he says. Will not a good father give good gifts? If you ask for bread, will he give you a stone? If you ask for a fish, will he give you a serpent? Jesus says, of course not. You know what? Sometimes maybe our prayers aren't being answered is because in our lack of knowledge of the future and knowing exactly what's best for us, sometimes we don't realize that in our attempt to pray for this daily bread that we're actually praying for a stone. Has anybody been there? Like sometimes when we're praying for something that we think is so good, like, like something that is nourishing, as, as the example in Matthew chapter 7, that someone would pray for a fish, but in reality, they might be praying for a serpent. And of course, the good father is not going to give his children a serpent, and he's not going to give them a stone. So sometimes we might not have our prayers being answered because we are praying for something that might do harm to our own lives. And why is that? Well, we don't see all of what God has in his good imperfect plan. We don't see it all. This is why we read from Isaiah chapter 55 last week, which says God's thoughts and his ways are way above our thoughts and our ways. How many times in my life have I been praying what I think is in will with the Father, and I've been asking for something that seems good, but I don't recognize that that very daily bread I'm praying for was actually a stone, and and oh, how thankful I am for unanswered prayers at times. When God in his infinite wisdom knew what was best in that moment. But God, I wanted this. I thought this was going to be so good. And God says, look, you don't see the end result. You don't see the future. I have something better. This was actually going to be harmful for you. This was not in line with my will. I have something for you that is going to meet the very need that you have. So maybe your unanswered prayer is for a reason. I'll finish with this. Another reason for unanswered prayers, and we'll close, uh, and we, we looked at this a few months ago, and I'll come back to it. Simply, sometimes the answer is no, and it's for a specific purpose. As we look in, if you remember, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, we find that Paul's prayer was not answered. And the reason it was not answered, because God wanted to do something in and through Paul in an incredible way. Well, what did he say in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? Paul prayed three times who literally committed his whole life to the good news of Jesus Christ, who walked in faithfulness uh, as a saint of of God more than just about anybody else we see in Scripture besides Christ. Like like Paul was was faithful in his walk with Christ, but he prayed three separate occasions for this thorn to be removed from his flesh. And God said, look, Paul, my grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in weakness. And what God wanted to show Paul and those who he ministered to and those who read the Word of God 2,000 some odd years later is that, you know what? Sometimes these prayers aren't answered because God is doing a work in us and through us for our good and for his glory. Here's what I've learned about prayer, church. In the past three weeks, is there are several things you could say about prayer. Here's what I've learned going through Matthew chapter 6 and Matthew chapter 7, and I'll close with this statement. I believe prayer forms us into who exactly God wants us to be. That prayer, it's one of those simple things, but it is so formational. It forms us because here's what happens. When we pray biblically, as we've seen the past three weeks, and we pray according to the will of God with the right heart and the right intentions, the way Jesus has called us to pray, what happens is that it forms us more and more into who Jesus wants us to be. It aligns, as we talked about last week, prayer is for us to align our will with God's will. And what happens when we do that, and we do that consistently, and we do that with persistence, and we do that daily, what happens is that our hearts 
begin to be formed more into the heart of Christ, which is exactly what God wants. As more and more each day, we start becoming more and more like Jesus. And so prayer, I, I know it's something that you learned as a kid, but it's something we should never forget, and it's something we should keep learning in because of the formational nature of prayer. Let me say this. As music team comes up, would, would you challenge yourself as the body of Christ? Would you challenge yourself after this week? I'm, I'm not preaching on prayer next week. We're, we're going into a new series. But would you take this week to challenge yourself? Where, where am I lacking in my prayer life? Are, are my prayers lined up with God's will? And, and to do a deep inventory on that. I, I encourage you. How do you learn to pray? Well, Jesus teaches us how to pray, but then the second uh, option is once you learn what Jesus has taught you how to pray, then you just got to keep doing it. And the more you pray, the more you're going to be formed to the character of Christ, and the more you're going to be able to line up with the will of God. And so believers, commit that time to prayer. If you truly want to be like Christ, which is, should be all of our goal, we need to develop a consistent prayer life. Now, we've talked about answered prayers, and I'll close with this. If you're here this morning, um, and you're not a Christian, and you're here this morning, and you have never put your trust in Jesus, if that's you, and you say, Christian, like, I, I hear it, I understand now that Jesus died on the cross, I understand that he rose from the grave, uh, and because of that, I can be saved, um, and, and this morning, you're thinking you want to be saved, but well, here's the good news. A prayer that God, I believe he answers every time, is... Romans chapter 10, verse 13, and it's this. The Bible says anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And I believe if you're here this morning and and you are are truly calling on Jesus and him alone to save you, I believe every single time the unbeliever who prays that will be saved because the Bible tells us that. And so this morning, maybe your prayer and a prayer that will be answered immediately is in your pew, you just need to cry out to God, God, will you save me? You haven't been saved before, you've never put your trust in him, but you find yourself at church this morning and you say, God, I, I want eternal life. Like, I, I want that life that was talked about in 1 John at the beginning of service. I believe in you. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again from the grave. I believe you're God, and I want to commit my life to you. If that's you this morning, I, I, would, I would encourage you as we sing to call out to Jesus. Jesus, will you save me? I turn from my ways. I want to trust fully in you. And as we sing, and as you pray that, here's what I encourage you to do. Would you come and let me know about that? As pastor, I would love to rejoice with you. I would love to answer maybe any questions you might have and then guide you in your next steps with Christ. But right now, there's one prayer that you need to pray if you've never been saved, and and that's the prayer for God to save you. Call upon him this morning. Jesus, will you save me from my sins? And I promise he will. So let's sing this morning, church. You pray that prayer. Would you come this morning? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. be seated. If you're wrestling with a decision, um, maybe questions about the church or joining the church, or you have questions about baptism or salvation, 
I'll be right outside those doors this morning. I would love to answer any questions you might have. Hey, remember September 1st, we are partnering with our church plant, Indian Hills, and having a baptism service on September the 1st. If you are interested in that, could you let me know this week? Uh, in other words, if you have not been baptized uh, and uh, you want to be baptized, uh, we understand that that's the call Christ has given all who put their trust in Jesus to then be baptized and to show that. Uh, if you want to do that, will you let me know this week because there's a little extra we have to prepare uh, for this service. Uh, and so if you're interested in that, come find me or Brother Jarek after service. Uh, and so we'll do that September the 1st. Uh, n- next up, church, I, I want to share something with you guys. Um, me and Danielle have been talking, and she has been praying, uh, and we had a conversation. Uh, and w- what's best for, for her and, and her family? Uh, and, and Danielle, you know, she's got Augie and Archie, uh, and she has come to me and, and just really emphasized the point. She's a Christian. I, I believe I don't want to miss out on these years of life, and I want to be fully committed uh, to them right now. And for me, I'm in that same stage of life. And I told Danielle, look, I want to fight for you to come back, but I'm not even going to ask you. I said, I believe that's what you need to do uh, right now. Uh, and so that's something she's been wrestling with for, um, you know, since Archie was born. Is this something she wants to continue to do? Uh, she has loved it, and she wants to come back, uh, and she wanted me to let you guys know that. Uh, but r- on August the 25th, that'll be Danielle's last um, day uh, on staff at the church. Don't worry, her and Gabe aren't going anywhere. Uh, they're going to continue to serve, and Gabe's going to continue to play the role of a deacon. Um, but, man, we want to honor Danielle and that decision uh, to be all in as a mother for her kids. And so we support that decision fully. Here's what I'm going to ask you. Uh, I think she's in children's church right now. Uh, I think she did that on purpose, so I wouldn't call her up. Um, hey, next week, we'll have a basket out front. Here's what I encourage you to do. Would you write a card or a letter to her letting you know her appreciation? Uh, parents, if you have a kid, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Would you have your child that's been an RS1 kid write that letter uh, for her? I think that would mean the world to her. She's going to continue to help us in this process of transitioning. Uh, and so if you are involved in any kids' ministry at all, Wednesdays or Sundays, um, here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Next Sunday, we're going to have a meeting, uh, and we'll put this out on newsletter, um, and we'll announce it again next week. But we're going to have a quick meeting after church just to make sure we have all our ducks in a row before RS1 kids start. Uh, and so if you're involved in Kenneth's kids ministry in any way, we'll meet next Sunday after church. And then for the rest of us, I encourage you, write cards, uh, give Danielle your encouragement. She's going to continue to help us out um, throughout the years to come. Uh, And so we just thank Danielle for all that she has done. Uh, And so that's all the announcements I have this morning. Uh, And so if you would stand, uh, we will sing one more song of praise uh, this morning before we leave. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.